Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. And thank you for joining today's webinar on updates and lessons learned on tribal co-stewardship. Before we get started, I want to briefly run through a few logistics. To ensure our speakers are the focus of today's presentations, all videos are currently turned off and microphones are muted. We will enable the video, microphone, and chat features for the Q&A session. To view closed captioning, please click on Live Transcript in the menu on the bottom of your screen and select Show Subtitle. Again, to view closed captioning, please click on the Live Transcript in the menu on the bottom of your screen and select Show Subtitle. Lastly, for those who wish to download a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation, it will be added to the White House Council on Native American Affairs website in the next few days. We will notify registrants when it is posted. Now I will turn things over to Maria Weissman to kick off today's discussion. Thank you, Dominique. My name is Maria Wiseman. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor on Climate and the Environment for Brian Newland, Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the Department of the Interior. I represent the Department on the White House Council on Native American Affairs Climate Adaptation Subcommittee. One of the primary goals of the subcommittee is to develop and deliver training for federal employees working on climate adaptation priorities. This year, the Climate Adaptation Subcommittee will host a series of monthly webinars to provide educational resources about consulting and coordinating with Indian tribes, Native Hawaiians, and other indigenous peoples in our combined effort to combat the climate crisis. Today, we're pleased to continue the series with a discussion of tribal co-stewardship. Today's discussion will open with Wheezy Pan Garriott, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the Department of the Interior. Wheezy is a member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. He was appointed to his role as Principal Deputy in 2021 by Deb Holland, Secretary of the Interior, and is a leader in the field of co-stewardship. We're also pleased to have Chief Ann Richardson, who has served as Chief of the Rappahannock Tribe since 1998 and is the first woman to lead a tribe in Virginia since the 1700s. As a fourth-generation chief in her family, Chief Ann has a long history of community leadership, including recently leading the effort to reclaim hundreds of acres of her tribe's ancestral lands. We're also pleased to have Patrick Gonzalez Rogers, who is a distinguished practitioner in residence at the Yale Center for Environmental Justice and a lecturer at the Yale School of the Environment. As the executive director of the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition, Pat led the effort to restore Bears Ears National Monument resulting in a landmark agreement in 2022 for co-stewardship of the monument. Welcome, Wheezy, Chief Ann and Pat, and thank you for joining us. Wheezy, please go ahead. Thank you, Maria. Um, good afternoon or morning, depending on where you're at. I, I greet you with a good heart. Uh, my name is uh, Wizib Khanlilal Garriott. I serve as a Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, uh, and I am a, a member of the Sichangu Lakota Oyate and uh, come from the uh, wrapped hair band of my people. Um, our government name is, is Rosebud Sioux Tribe. I'm really excited to, to be here today and to, to join uh, awesome, uh, amazing uh, experts and with, with Chief Ann and with... Uh, with with Pat, uh, just awesome awesome folks to to be a part of of their company. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, you know co stewardship and from the federal side of things and and do uh, some framing and 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 you know uh, don't want to take too long and, and give more time to to my colleagues and and for questions. Um, but I, I think to to kind of understand uh, kind of the larger moment uh, that we're in. It's important to to be familiar with and to you know kind of understand uh, two policies that have really been pushed by uh, the administration and by the president. Uh, one is America the Beautiful, and uh, you know the associated uh, you know goal to conserve um, thirty uh, percent of of our land by twenty thirty. 
and I think a lot of folks in, in out. the country uh, are, are understand and are familiar with that initiative. Related and not mutually exclusive, but also at the same time independent, is the tri is the president's tribal homelands initiative, which the the goal of that initiative is really to uh, strengthen, uh, protect, and ensure that every native nation uh, we have sub we we recognize five hundred seventy four of them have a homeland. Uh, to, to call their own, uh, that is their original lands, and that we need to be working to uh, ensure that, that, they, that they have what they need in order to uh, take care of their people and, and to continue to uh, fulfill uh, their destiny as, as Native nations according to their own beliefs and traditions. These are, are not mutually exclusive and, in fact, uh, complementary to one another. Uh, I, I like to think that uh, in the middle, right, when, when those two policies come together, uh, what they create is uh, tribal co-stewardship and, and homeland return. And uh, I'll first talk about what, what co-stewardship is and then talk a little bit more about what that looks like. Um, we, we think of, of co-stewardship uh, also sometimes called co-management, uh, as something that's on a spectrum. And uh, on one hand, uh, on one side, you have what we would consider to be uh, co-management. And then on the far end, we, what we would call uh, co-stewardship. Co uh, and let's, I think it's also important to, to distinguish that, that these um, are not necessarily uh, land ownership. Um, but I, I know that it's, it's, it's a part of uh, connecting uh, tribes and indigenous people to their original homelands and being able to bring in uh, their uh, expertise that is so, so, so much needed. So on one hand, we have co-management where, you know, a native nation is, is co-managing uh, a federal property. Uh, Oftentimes, uh, that is brought about um, by a court settlement and or uh, legislation. And uh, we see a lot of that kind of co-management of land and resources in the uh, Northwest around fish, uh, you know, also in, in other places. And so that, that is mandated by law. Uh, the return of the National Bison Range uh, to the Salish and Kootenai, for example, is 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 a part of that, where where by legislation uh, they the, the land was returned to them, and then on kind of going down the the list in terms of on the spectrum, would be some kind of agreement uh, that is formal and written, um, and that has very specific uh, things laid out in it. Uh, oftentimes, that would be a funding agreement. Uh, or a 638 self-determination contract, for example, where uh, a tribe or a group of tribes or whatever that entity may be is performing specific activities or making uh, decisions uh, in certain areas on, a, on land management. Then uh, kind of another point on the spectrum, one could think about um, participation in a management plan. Uh, contributions to the plan, bringing expertise to a land management plan, uh, sitting on a decision-making board. Uh, that was one of the things we recently did with the the, the recent uh, bison announcement and the creation of the uh, a, a council uh, within Interior that makes decisions around bison management that reserves a seat for a tribal leader. That's an example of, of what that might look like. Uh, and then finally, you know, kind of looking at it on, on the, the, the far end of the spectrum, it might be an MOU or some other kind of agreement that uh, would, would kind of meet the goals and objectives and purposes of, of a tribe. Uh, a lot of times that might uh, entail uh, harvesting or gathering rights or certain access rights uh, for, to perform cultural or ceremonial activities um, during the year. And so there is no one specific form of uh, co-stewardship. Uh, we, we like to think of it being on a spectrum and uh, it's really about uh, uh, accessing uh, one, uh, 
uh, it's allowing the tribe um, and recognizing their inherent uh, ties to these lands, to the lands, um, while at the same time, uh, something that benefits the, the federal government. And I just want to make uh, one point on uh, on each of those. Uh, tribes have been here uh, for, for thousands of years since time immemorial. They're Native nation sovereignty predates the formation of the United States, predates the colonies, and uh, they've been here. They've, they've been the first owners, the first stewards of this of, of these lands, and they did a pretty good job for thousands of years in managing those lands. Uh, and it's only been uh, recently, within the past several hundred years, that we've uh, uh, not done such a great job. And so. Uh, well, on one hand, right, like tribe, tribes need uh, and, and have to have access to those lands. At the same time, the federal government, we need tribes to be at the table as well. Because if we're going to tackle some of the larger issues that we're facing, not only as a country, but as a, as, as a globe, as, as the entire world, we need indigenous expertise at the table. We need indigenous knowledge. We need tribes being being able to to be at the table, and to share some of that knowledge. Um, I think a lot of folks have heard and read that you know eighty percent of Earth's biodiversity is protected on twenty percent of the land, which is controlled by five percent of Earth's population, and that five percent is indigenous people. And and so uh, native people have been been uh, punching above their weight for a long time, and and it's time to to start thinking about how we can. Uh, build on that that expertise, that knowledge, and and uh, begin uh, giving them resources to to do that. Um, and then one last thing, and then I'll I'll be quiet. Uh, this is you know we talked about these kind of two larger overarching policies. This uh, is all supported. I, I like to think of it as a galaxy that is supported by uh, e uh, solar systems of kind of smaller individual policies. And those would be policies around indigenous knowledge, sacred sites, treaty rights, uh, Indian uh, youth, uh, public-private partnerships, indigenous international conservation, uh, tribal consultation, and then specific policies ar around uh, co-stewardship. And so uh, the secretary issued a uh, joint secretarial order uh, with... Uh, with on coast stewardship with uh, Secretary uh, Vilsack from USDA, and then recently um, NOAA uh, has joined as well. And so that directs us to uh, begin entering into coast stewardship agreements with Native nations and to find opportunities uh, for Native land return. Um, and so that's kind of a, a big overall uh, uh, kind of uh, explanation of, of kind of where we've come over the past year, and and then I'll uh, I'll be quiet now and and uh, listen to and learn from from the experts who are actually doing this stuff. Thank you, Weezy. Uh, Chief Ann. Well, um, hello, Wingapo from um, the Rappahannock Tribe, uh, the Powhatan Nations of Virginia. Um, uh, we are Beaver Clan, and I'm um, honored to be a part of this. Um, presentation today and and thank you for uh, including us on this very important issue um, as Weezy has said um, it is um, part of this initiative through the Biden administration to return tribal lands to tribes and um, to provide some co-stewardship or co-management of public lands um, and I will just start out by saying uh, I started this uh, a couple of years ago, trying to get these this very important piece of land back that um, Captain John Smith first um, documented in the record. These three towns of the Rappahannock tribe, we coop them, uh, Macho Peak and uh, Pisicoac. Pisicoac was our first phase. Um, on these 100-foot cliffs on the Rappahannock River that were filled with diatomaceous earth, uh, which is um, something that is accumulated through organisms over millions and millions of years, and it turns into a white powder. And 
it uh, reflects the sun in an amazing way on these 100 foot cliffs. And he equated them to the cliffs of Dover. And this was a place of our three towns and where our sacred ceremonies were held and the place where we protected our territory. Um, very important to the tribe. And th there had been two developers, one early on um, who wanted to build, built his house, but wanted to build 300 homes. Uh, this is about a 2000 acre swath of land on the riverfront. Um, the county wanted, approved it and he was starting to build and then the conservation agencies and organizations got upset about it and we began to fight it. And um, in the end, U.S. Fish and Wildlife got, was, were able to take that piece of property and protect it. Part of that tract of land was 465 acres, um, which is the town of Pisacoac, traditionally for our tribe, um, that was a part of this development that we were able to get back. Um, through conservation agencies and foundations who care about the protection and conservation of sacred lands for tribes. Um, it was kind of a, a different um, uh, process for us because we were recently recognized in 2018 by an act of Congress, um, primarily because we live in Virginia, which is a very colonialized state still. Um, and so um, we, a lot of our records were destroyed and manipulated and we could not meet the criteria that was set up uh, under the FAP process. So uh, we ended up going to Congress and Congress seeing the petitions that we had submitted, um, it was clear that the state was the reason that we didn't have what we needed to have to get recognition. And so they were able to get it through Congress. When we went to work with the state after the fact, we actually had to go to the General Assembly and get tweaks to various laws in different agencies for the tribes to even be able to get any kind of state funding. So we had to go through that process first. Some of that we're still going through, but in particular, uh, the millions of dollars that are given to the state primarily went to um, large white landowners uh, in the form of conservation easements that they got paid to take care of their own land. None of it had ever gone to tribes. And so that's where I began my fight. And to get that changed, we just got $500,000 through the State Department of Conservation, um, the Conservation Fund. Uh, and, and so we were able to get the 465 acres back, but then there were two other tracts of land on this 2000 acre piece that needed to be protected as well. So now we've cut that up into phase two and phase three. Phase two was a 700 acre swath that um, was uh, bordered our property that we had bought. Um, and then there was a thousand acres of another developer who was approved for development of a resort, a golf course, uh, housing, uh, the whole nine yards. And um, through a fault of his own ignorance and um, greed, he made some mistakes and the state shut his project down. Uh, he filed bankruptcy and the conservation fund was able to go in last November and uh, secure this piece of property out of the bankruptcy court. Uh, now the tribe's job is to raise the money to pay them back $8.5 million. Um, so that's what I've been working on. Working for you know a couple of generations with U.S. Fish and Wildlife at the refuge over on the Rappahannock River. You know, my parents had, pow we had our powwows over there in my parents' generation. Uh, when I was a young girl. 
And so we had always had this relationship with this place because the place that they owned was the historical capital town of our tribe. So our people went there as often as they could. Um, and so we went to them as the natural partners in this to say, um, we want this piece of property protected. You want it protected. Let's work together to see how we can get this secured. And then we will co-manage it. We will co-steward this. We'll take our resources um, uh, that we can get, both manpower and equipment and whatever, um, and you take yours and we'll put them together and we will manage this place in a way that has not been done before. And we will share our indigenous knowledge with you so that you can make sure that uh, people who come here will be able to take care of this property the way it should be. And so they have become our forever partners in this. Um, they are uh, providing $5 million in terms of, um, whereas before we, we raised all the money and then we donated a conservation easement to US Fish and Wildlife. In this transaction, because we did that, they are purchasing the conservation easement, which brings uh, our lift down to $3.5 million. So we're going together in on this land to protect it. It will be transferred to the tribe and the tribe will transfer it then to the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, in the form of a land trust. But um, in the meantime, the tribe and US Fish and Wildlife will co-manage this place. As a result of that, um, they had a lodge there on their property, which was the, the capital town for the tribe, Cat Point Creek. Uh, they decided to give us the lodge. And so now we are renovating the lodge and we're, um, we're going to be opening that up as an indigenous conservation education center. Because what we realized is not only do our kids need to know this information, but people needed to know this information for future generations of um, congressmen and senators and presidents and people who would be land managers on this land that only takes up a small portion of what the uh, territory was for our tribe. So uh, we desired for people to know how to take care of that land in generations to come not just our own people, but people in general. Uh, so that's what we have decided to do. And we're doing all of this in conjunction with US Fish and Wildlife. The one thing that has been, I guess, a challenge for us outside of Virginia is that maybe some agencies, they've heard about the initiative, they, they've read the executive order, but they really don't know how to apply it to individual tribes that are coming in. Um, and so there needs to be clear guidelines. Um, so Weezy, when you were saying co-management, I'm hearing things like, does that mean we're gonna share budgets? Um, does that mean um, that we're gonna share decision-making over these public lands with tribes? So there are lots of things that need to be clarified um, in this initiative as we're, we're going forward with it now, putting boots on the ground. We need specific guidelines on how that is going to work. Um, you know, we've kind of made this work, but there are other places that we might want to co-manage with these national forests. And we need to know how that's going to work. So not only have there been challenges at the state level for us, but there have also been challenges at the federal level for us. Great, thank you, Chief Ann. Um, Pat, please go ahead. Hello, Fa, I feel my. Fa, Fa, Tai, Tele, Fla, Fa. 
in my own um, native tongue, Samoan, um, welcome and thank you. Um, I'm also very clear because I do um, almost exclusively work in the native space to tell people I'm not Native American. I have my own native culture. Um, it is Samoan. Um, if you don't know of the Polynesian family, Samoans are the sexiest and I'm plain proof of that. So we're clear on that. Um, you know, I, I I, I come from this as um, a formal um, former Fed, but I've worked in um, other things within the Native space, um, including the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. So I also have been involved with the Papa Hanau Mokuakea, the largest national marine monument in the world, um, in which the Office of Hawaiian Affairs um, is a co-manager, and they actually bought their seat by bringing their own resources. So it's another kind of wrinkle and iteration. But when I think about these things, there are four features, and I... Um, I tend to think about this um, really in pragmatic terms. First and foremost, it is the exercise of tribal sovereignty. When people ask me why the Bears Ears was successful, it is because of the leadership of our tribal leaders, but their ability of the inherent sovereignty um, to really um, fill the room in a different patina than even the largest um, nonprofit conservation groups can do. And so that political affectation um, is at the core of this. Two, it creates tangible and efficient results um, in terms of its productivity that are readily apparent. And so as um, Wizzy led us off today, there is a time and memorial qualitative feature to the land management and conservation methods that Native people have exercised from time and memorial. Um, three, it allows for a direct insert of traditional and indigenous ways. And so when I say this, I think too often there is a conversation that people bifurcate traditional knowledge juxtaposed against science. And then the reality is there is a large overlap and these things are done in tandem and they are very compatible. However, I think um, until recently, we have kind of subjugated in a subordinated way, traditional ways, and we really need to think about them as two peaks that complement each other. Um, and then finally, um, for me, is co-management, collaborative management, co-stewardship, you know, whatever the vernacular is a real-time exercise of restorative justice and environmental justice. By doing this, we correct the inequalities, um, the historical events, and one must really remember through the treaties um, that are a little under 400 and all of the other kinds of dealings of the last several hundred years, there is no other way to say it. There was a violent overtaking of native lands that was intentional and prescribed by the US government. It was because they wanted to occupy these lands. And this provides some correction to it. So those are the four main points that I, I, I wanna kind of amplify. There, there are two other things that I think are really kind of, um, at least where I sit now, um, that I wanted to make observation. One, I think too often, and this is especially true in the conservation environmental community, we want best practices. But because of the great kind of divergence of capacity and infrastructure relative to tribal governance, um, you know, let's consider a small rancheria relative to a large land-based tribe like um, Navajo. It really requires the predicate of um, peering in and making some very quantifiable kinds of observations about capacity and infrastructure. Um, because of that, um, 
I don't think um, the way we use the portability of features and how you do it can just be done in every situation. What we have to do is be observant um, because I think there are in, um, idiosyncratic contours and features specific to each tribe. And we, we need to be very observant of not being monolithic about that. The second portion, and be, um, I say this because I'm no longer a Fed, and so I can kind of harp on this. I think the department has to take a serious look on their utilization and liberalizing the implementation of 638 contracting. Um, it has now become, and this is from many of the um, land management agencies, um, you know, there are four kind of primary ones, BLM, Fish and Wildlife, um, National Parks, and U.S. Forest Service that use that as not as a door, but as a gate to keep tribes out. And the rationale is it creates a slippery slope. And while this is a federal kind of broadcast, I call bullshit. Um, because if you look at the 94 amendments, and I was general counsel to the Indian Affairs Committee, there is no legislative history about protecting the agency. It is done on behalf of the tribe for the productivity and efficiency that they can carry this out. And that is why they certify 638 contracting. So my premise and posit is we need to open that gate wider because it really allows for the distribution of administrative of resources and assets that should really be on the tribal side. And so um, I'll close up by saying those are my pithy comments for today. Thank you, Pat, and thank all of you. So we have some time for some questions. Um, and I want to start out with a question that was submitted through Eventbrite. Tribes in Washington state are concerned about co-stewardship and their treaty hunting rights and the lack of access to their unusual, to, oh, sorry, to their usual and accustomed hunting areas. These areas are closed to tribal hunting by private timber companies. Could our speakers address this? Well, I, I think from, from a, on, on the federal side, uh, you know, one of the what we're talking about is 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 federal lands, and that uh, you know, if if we're talking about uh, access uh, to uh, treaty rights uh, or to you know kind of other rights, um, then then that's something where where I think the tribe should put a a request in and and say, uh, here's the federal property that that we're interested in in co-managing co-stewarding. Um, and let's start that that process and that conversation. Um, I, I think it's it's a little bit more difficult if we're talking about state lands uh, because we don't necessarily have authority there, uh, or if we're talking about uh, private lands because we we don't have uh, authority there as, as well. But I think that that what's exciting uh, about a lot of this work is you know really looking at, at like uh, Chief An's example, that was private land that they acquired. Uh, you know, and, and you might, some tribes may say, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not great that, that we have to buy back, uh, land that was once ours. Uh, you know, but I think we, we get that. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, I think some tribes just take the initiative to, to kind of do what's necessary to make that happen. Um, just as a, as a plug, we released our budget today, uh, with substantial increases, uh, for the, uh, land acquisition, uh, fund for uh, 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 landless or, or tribes that don't have a lot of land. Um, and so, you know, that's another area where I think that, that folks can can get involved with, with as well. Over. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? I did see um, a question in the chat. Um, and I think it was um, directed at me about um, addressing some of the challenges and lessons learned in the process of forming the Bears Ears and bringing that work. And so um, 
three different things. I, I will reiterate uh, again my first point. Let the tribes lead and let the affectation of sovereignty be at the primacy of this. Now, to that, I think the lesson learned, um, and you know, one must kind of really have um, a reflection that we did much of this um, during the adversarial period of the Trump administration, where they basically featured the, the trust responsibility. Um, and so because of that, um, we had to be in a situation um, where we really partnered up um, with large philanthropy, traditional conservation, community groups, and outreach Door retail, um, outdoor retailers. My point to this is, um, in order for us to do the work, um, we really want your partnership. And, and so um, this is the other portion about it is, if you let the tribes lead, they um, inherently know what to do, but sometimes they need to kind of fortify and buttress their um, activities. So and I, I think that's something that we don't truly kind of consider. The third point, though, is one of comportment. And what I mean by that is um, many people now talk about letting tribes leave. They want, um, you know, just not in the Indian country, but within the greater BIPOC community, they want to see that representation. What is lacking, though, is not the enthusiasm for Native leadership. It is the institutional gestation of these organizations. If you want new leadership, it will look feel and smell differently. And for many people, it becomes very awkward for them because they have not seen it. And so my particular point is back up a little bit. Let us do the work because again, if really what you're looking for is a different iteration, a more robust patina, um, the process from these communities is going to make the process starkly and dramatically different from what you, you're used to. And so uh, we need some space in order to do the work. We appreciate the support, but we also need your patience. So those are the kind of three highlights that I would say of lessons learned relative to the Bears Ears. Great, thank you. Also, there's uh, a question for me about um, why would I put this land into trust with the BIA? Um, and the reason that we would put it into trust with the BIA is to protect it for future generations so that um, our tribe will always have um, our sovereign status on that property. And so what Patrick was saying earlier about part of us asserting our sovereignty in taking these lands back is when we put that um, those lands into trust with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, then we automatically have sovereign powers over those lands um, to make decisions and to manage the way we want. So it gives us another level of authority that we wouldn't have otherwise. Great, thank you. Uh, another question. Is the view that co-management of federal land can only mean non-development of the land? I can speak to that. Um, so we are working uh, out right now. Easements for conservation are, are, you know, all of them are different depending on who the partners are and what they want to do with them. And so for our tribe, we wanted to protect the land to make sure the land was conserved as well as anyone else. But we are negotiating a piece of that out so that we can put a welcome center there um, because this was all, you know, all private property, all closed off to the public. So we're gonna open it to the public. We're gonna put a welcome center there. We're gonna put trails in there. And because the state of Virginia held our history and would um, really closed our history off. We were tribes without land, tribes without 
resources. State didn't give us any resources. And so any history that came out about the tribes came through the state. Um, but now the tribes are able to open up trails where people can go out and experience the land, feel the power of that place, experience the river, and learn the truth about our history for the first time. And to kind of follow up on that, you know, I mean, in regards to the Bears Ears, um, I'm no longer there, so I don't want to say that, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of the tribes, but um, they certainly want a balanced development approach, and that does not mean zero balance, but you also have to look, again, at the inherent kinds of definitions that we give to federal properties. Ours is a national monument. It has at its primacy the cultural and historic and scientific value, you know, juxtaposed against a national park, which are there for educational and recreational activities. So built in and embedded to that um, is um, really protecting wide swaths of this. Um, and I, I do want to make a point. What a lot of people don't understand is the landscape, because from Native people, we do have a duality um, that is an extension of ourself. And in many of our cultures, we deitize the landscape. Um, and so it is the place of worship. It is the chapel, if you will. And the way we talk about iconic kinds of places, um, like the Cathedral of Notre Dame, which globally has such kind of deference because it is, you know, a titular kind of example of Gothic, Gothic architecture. Someone's been reading National Geographic. Um, is the same way we think about the bear's ears. And so you should have that same sensibility that you are in our church. Um, and because the church has uh, something several miles away, it is the totality of the landscape and the pristine, which then makes the sacredness of it. And so that is really has to be conveyed from a native perspective. Um, and then again, just re reinforcing, we're, we are talking about a national monument. So the designation is already inherent to that. Just to, to, to build off that, uh, you know, each one of these kind of federal agencies or, or land designations, you know, comes with its own whole unique set of rules, uh, Bureau of Land Management, Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service, uh, you know, NOAA. Uh, so, so, so you have to operate within that, that, that kind of framework. And, and th those are the, the rules that we have to, to, to live by and they're different. Fish and Wildlife, uh, you know, U.S. Forest Service, very different than, than Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, so so we, we have those rules. Uh, within that, though, I think the big thing is is really making sure that the you know in this we're we're, we're deferring to tribes and and what they want and, and what they're looking at. I'm thinking of a particular uh, co stewardship uh, a proposal that we're looking at right now, where uh, it invo involves a, a lake that that you know is adjacent to the reservation, and the tribe wants to put in uh, boat docks. Right? They they've said we've fished here for 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 a long long time, and we'd like to to uh, enhance our ability to fish. And, and interact and, 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 you know, swim and, and, you know, just be a part of that environment. And so uh, we want to, we need some boat docks. So again, it, it really, really depends. Um, and, and it's really important to the, 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 the tribe lead, lead in, in, in that discussion. Wizzy makes a great point. And, and I think another really kind of illustrative example is the Columbia River. The Columbia River and salmon are sacred, but what is also um, kind of packed in there is they save the salmon industry. And so there is a high yield economic activity. Um, and so I don't think we, we need to kind of, you know, create a binary that one is not the other. Um, I think there's some balance to all of this. All right, thank you. Uh, from the chat, we have a conservation green energy, green economy a question. How do you feel about plants and weeds used for alternative fuels? Uh, again, I, I, 
we're talking about i think i i defer to the tribe right like like we're talking about indigenous knowledge and uh i, I think if you're looking at it at least you know from, from my tradition that there is no weed right every plant has right. a use and a purpose and uh it's it's fight and and a lot of times if you have an imbalance an imbalance of, of of plants it shows an imbalance in the soil and and we got to fix that and we should look to the look to the tribes who, who who know what they're talking about to to do this and uh you know quite frankly we we'd be avoiding a lot of the challenges uh you know that we're facing uh if we just listen to the tribes from the beginning Great, thank there you. Is, oh, go ahead, Pat. No, I was gonna say, there is a comment about um, common definitions. Um, and I think this is a, a really great question. Um, it is not as if we can turn to Webster's and you know, there's the definition. I, I will say this too, that um, Wheezy and I are, are involved in bringing um, a small kind of group of people to have initial conversation to really speak about um, co-management and making identifications of the attributes and levers and maybe where we can go um, with this from a kind of a public policy basis. And hopefully we can maybe get to some commonality. That said, you know, we are not the kind of oracles of all things co-management. Um, this meeting um, that we'll be doing later in March um, with Kevin Washburn and some others is to really kind of at least make some um, observations, put pen to paper, and then um, really have an iterative process and then bringing this paper to um, really all quarters of Indian countries so they can weigh in. And hopefully, um, I think from there, we can maybe come to some agreement and some definitiveness on how we use these terms um, and then make them relative to particular situations. But I, I think, you know, we're still in the beginning phases and it's somewhat fluid. Great, thank you. I think that answers the, the question in the chat. Um, a question from the chat, what advice do you have for a tribe that wants to do co-stewardship, but the federal land management agency is resistant? Hmm. Uh, if it's an interior, uh, send a letter uh, to the secretary and uh, CC uh, myself and a whole bunch of other people so that we can uh, take a look at it. And uh, if, if it's a, one of the other agencies, uh, you know, at USDA, make sure that, that you include uh, Heather Don Thompson, uh, who's the tribal relations uh, manager over there. And if it's at uh, Commerce, uh, Sean Deshini uh, would be the, the person to include there. Great, thank you, Weezy. Uh, can you speak to administrative barriers that burden tribal communities in regard to access to federal funding? I believe there was a mention of 638 contracting. How might structures like that be improved? Sounds like a wheezy question. <laughs> so, uh, so, 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 so one of the, and, and, and Pat kind of, kind of referenced this a little bit, is this idea of uh, inherent federal function and, and whether a, a specific federal activity uh, must uh, remain with the federal government or can there be a delegation or can it be contracted out for the performance of that service um and and those are kind of two two areas one is is the 638 funding to you know perform a service and what is the scope of that and then also you know on the shared decision making process in terms of uh at what point is is that uh you know uh, kind of leaving that inherent federal function and so uh, there, there's this this idea that only a limited and certain amount of, of uh, programs or programmatic functions are contractable. And uh, we publish a list of those programs every year. Uh, but to be clear, that is not the, de the definitive list. It is just a list of ones that we've identified. And we've actually held a consultation on that to get more guidance because uh, this is going to, to, you know, I think Pat, Pat alluded to this, this, this is going to, to take up a lot of uh, time, energy uh, moving forward in terms of what, what, what we can and can't do. But I, I think we're really only limited in terms of our creative thinking here. And I'll, I'll post that as well. 
Great. Thank you. Weezy, you posted a couple of resources in the chat. Um, the, it was the co-stewardship report and the co-stewardship authorities. You want to say a couple of words about those? Uh, yeah. So, so uh, we, we have a whole bunch of, of documents, very specific documents, 14 of them that I, I've counted so far. I don't want to put all of them in there. Uh, but, but in addition to the, the, uh, the, the secretary order directs us to create, to give a list of the, of the authorities, uh, legal authorities that, that we can utilize to enter into co-stewardship agreements, uh, as well as an annual report on what, what we've done. And so that I put that in the link. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, I'll, uh, and, and so there's a, there's a whole lot of work here going on in terms of very kind of uh, federal uh, kind of policy and, and documents. And, and there's also a list of uh, step down guidance, uh, National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, BLM and BIA. We have also issued uh, guidance to the field in terms of how to implement that. And then the next piece that we're going to be working on this year is I think what, what Chief I was talking about was uh, how does it get implemented and we and we got to do training, 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 so that uh, our folks in the field understand what this is, understand what the authorities they have, and also to understand that that this is a directive that this is coming from from the top that that we are to that the, the secretary orders is very clear, the secretary directs these agencies to enter into co-stewardship agreements with federally recognized Indian tribes. That's a directive. And it also directs us to look at opportunities for land return. Great. Thank you for that. We're almost at time. So I want to thank you, Weezy, Chief Ann, and Pat. Uh, really great. And I want to acknowledge your work and for bringing this timely information to us today. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, this webinar series is designed to provide educational resources to all of you as you consider climate impacts in your work. I want to encourage you to attend the next webinar in April, sponsored by EPA. We'll hear about priorities and themes in tribal, tribal climate adaptation. Uh, registration will be available soon through Eventbrite. And if you follow the White House Council on Native American Affairs Climate Adaptation Subcommittee on Eventbrite, You'll be notified as soon as registration goes live. And thank you again to our panelists. It's been really fantastic, a really good conversation. And uh, thank you all, everybody from the audience, and uh, have a good day. Thank you, Maria.